the box of this. <laughs> like uh, I brought this from my apartment. Okay, no, no, these are special. I mean, this is the. So I have a full box in, uh, in Chicago, and I don't allow anybody. To, uh, when I finish teaching, I take all of them. I, <laughs> Oh, this is a, an incredible um, uh, chalk. All right. So I assume over lunch you reviewed everything that you heard in the two previous lectures. And um, I think the previous course was much nicer and less chaotic than, than mine. So now I have to remember where we ended. Okay. So um, I know I have to do this thing about the interior, but before I, um, I do it, I want to decide I have all this. Okay, let's let's start with the yeah, let's start with the interior. All right, so a couple examples about no interior. I gave you enough examples about interior. You saw in the previous lecture what it means. Uh, you saw that um, the viscose solution basically loses all the many uh, solutions you can have and just have a, gives you this big picture. So now let me stick with some very concrete examples. So one of them is this. So I'm including some uh, front propagation with different velocities. And um, let's say at t equals 0, uh, I start with uh, initial data, the, the distance from x to gamma 0. And any time I use a distance, distance from uh, x to gamma 0 is the signed distance. So it's positive inside and negative outside. Which means even before that, I always work with the triple of sets. And so I always have to have an inside and outside. And so the result here about the interior was that if you take uh, A to be Lipschitz in space time and either A of XT has a fixed sign or um, a of x, A is independent of time. There is no interior. Um, let me explain that quickly without writing a proof, is that um, if this has a fixed sign, the front either goes out or comes back. And once it starts going, it goes with strict, uh, uh, it increases strictly, because think that if you were in the front, that will be one, because it will be like the distance function. And so the dt, the time derivative of the distance function, will be either strictly positive or negative, and so there's no problem. And if it has, so the first one is easy to think about. The second one is, um, it, you can think of it like that. Um, let's say these are the sets where A is 0. It's independent of time. That's the sets where A is 0. You solve the problem AX du equals 0. So if you happen to be here, you don't move. OK, because if you have, I mean, this is heuristic, but that's true. If you happen to be at places where A vanishes, you cannot move. And so, therefore, there is a separate issue about the, the problems are separated. 
And in each one of them, the velocity is positive or negative, so there is no interior. And so you can think of this uh, cylinder, I mean, whatever the, wherever the A is bounded, as some kind of a natural boundary. And again, formally, when that's true, you get zero. Okay. So now I want to, um, I, I'm not going to show you a proof for that. But I want to state another, and, and um, okay. The next result has to do with um, motion by mean temperature. So, for simplicity, I'm going to start writing MCU there, which this means the trace of identity minus du tensor du unit vectors d square of u. So that's the definition of MCU. And the result is that if you have a gamma, if there exist, given gamma zero, if there exist constants C1, C2, and C3, and some X0 in RD, and the skew symmetric matrix H such that C1 X minus X0. It takes long to write it, but it's uh, So mean curvature of D. If this is non-zero on gamma zero, then there is no interior. And this is exactly uh, what I was saying um, uh, before about this uh, uh, question of the Georgie is that um, this thing is the generator of rotations. This thing is the, is the generator of, like, uh, of um, dilations. And this thing, together with dilations, is the uh, generator of translations in time. So if you have these two things, uh, you have uh, no interior. And for the proof of that, just to see how it comes up, uh, you just need to look. So this is, uh, again, uh, dilations, um, um, uh, rotations, translations in time. Translations in space are irrelevant. And uh, it's a little bit to see that this equation is invariant under rotation. Uh, and um, then uh, you have no interior. And the reason is that basically the following function A little bit louder. Uh, this thing is uh, skew symmetric. Skew. Okay. And the proof for that is very simple. Once, if I look at that function phi of u. Uh, One C one H. Let me write it down again. So uh, this is you here. Sorry for the stupid notation. That closes the u, that closes the phi. So I'm taking a function uh, u, which is the solution to the problem, with initial data, the distance function. I'm translated in space uh, by x0, some x0. Then I change, I'm rotating, I'm, I'm dilating in, in um, I'm dilating here 
and, and there with a C1, and I'm also doing a rotation. And I claim this function is a solution. I mean, phi is an increasing function. This is a solution. This. Yes. Uh, okay, I messed it up here. It's a parenthesis, this comma. This is the function u evaluated at this point. Yes, I'm sorry. And um, so I claim this function is a solution. Just do the computation. Okay? And uh, UH, it's easy to see by the assumption that UH at x0 minus our original U, uh, UX of 0, is bigger than that. This is uh, H, H. So two statements here. The first one is purely computation. Take that, you plug it in, and uh, the equation is in this easy computation for that. There is no x dependence, so everything is translation invariant. You plug that in. The second uh, observation is that you have that. Now, why is that true? Think of it as a, a, a differentiate with respect to h and see what you get. The condition I have there is nothing else but um, dh of uh at gamma at the condition I have here is nothing than that. If you differentiate with respect to h, um, the x minus x0 times the gradient, you see it from here. The h comes down from there. One part of the time derivative, you see it from there. The other part, you see it from that. OK? Now, so our assumption is that this quantity, although it's only at h equals 0, doesn't vanish. And by a simple argument, you find that this thing doesn't vanish for any t. Again, formally, it's like linearizing the operator. So this quantity. Uh, if you have, um, it's one way to see symmetries in your problem. You write down the scaling, you take a derivative with respect to that scaling, and by maximum principle, or not maximum principle, basic theory, that solves the linearized equation, so it propagates. All these things, again, are, are using viscose solutions, so they're more difficult to prove than what to say, but that's the case. So this doesn't, uh, remains non zero. And now it's in the end to complete the proof. Uh, think of it like that. If you had interior, if let's say this was the gamma t at some time, this property tells you that you have a problem there. Okay, because that will be identically zero in that region. Okay. So I, there is no time to give you all the. Uh, Formation, in particular, one question that it's reasonable to ask is I'm making an assumption here only, uh, I should have said uhx0, I should have said this thing is on gamma 0 only. Okay? The assumption I had was only on gamma 0, but nevertheless propagates. And the next thing I'm going to do, or maybe two things down the road, it will have to do with the fact that it's enough to see what happens on the gamma zero, nothing else. OK, so now a couple more examples. Let's go to this problem. And let me give you an example where you have interior.
And the example is, so if this change is sign, it's false. And the canonical example that everybody uses is this in 1D. So clearly this thing changes sign. And then uh, if you use a proof that is based on the control interpretation of the problem, you can show that there is interior. It's ut equals uh, x minus t ux. And uh, uh, let me do one more example, which has to do with um, what Francesco asked me with the volume preserving flow. So let's start with uh, gamma zero, which is two walls that are equal in uh, whatever in radius and one that is smaller. So our gamma zero is the union of the spheres. Huh? And these things have radius R zero, and this has radius R zero, I'm, I'm sorry. R zero, R zero, and I'm doing it, I'm taking it like that. And the motion I'm going to take is minus mean curvature plus a forcing term alpha t. And the alpha t is the one that will come from the volume preserving. Uh, the alpha t is equal to 2 pi times the number of disjoint parts of gamma zero, of gamma t. times uh, the inverse of the length. That's the, the motion I'm going to uh, look at. So if, for example, at gamma zero, I have three. This is three. And this lambda inverse L is the length plus the length plus the length. OK? And this is the. Uh, the kind of equation that comes up in, uh, when you do um, uh, pre uh, volume preserving flow, and this will come up sometimes as a Lagrange multiplier. So the way it comes up in the volume preserving flow is that you have a typical equation that gives you uh, uh, the allen kahn equation, I mean the reaction diffusion that I will explain in a minute, but you add an additional constraint that the, the, the set, the, the, the um, volume of the place where the solution goes to zero, whatever stays fine, uh, fixed. That's a Lagrange multiplier. Uh, and uh, that brings up the, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, that's a minimization problem. And you get a Lagrange multiplier with a constraint, and that's the alpha t. And here we're doing, a, and typically alpha t is not known. Here I'm writing an alpha t that we can write it down. All right, so what is happening with this picture? Since I chose R0 to be less than capital R0, First of all, these things don't touch with each other. They, um, they move independently for a small time. Okay, for small time, they move independently. There is no way they're going to, to hit each other. I haven't told you yet the distance between x1 and x2, and let's say this is x3. But for small time, the three components move independently. Now, what do I mean by move independently? The alpha t is the same, right? So moving independently doesn't mean that they don't see the alpha t. What I mean by that is that they don't hit each other, right? Is that clear? The alpha t is always there, but they, they go like that. And now choose as t1 the soup of the times t such that rt is positive. So this moves. So the gamma t is the union of the boundary, is the boundary of gamma x1 um, rt union the boundary of x2 rt union the boundary of x3, little rt. Okay? Now, 
this may be infinity. I take them really far away, that can become infinity. But let's assume that uh, T1 is finite. There is no reason, I'm not claiming it's going to be finite, but I'm saying let's assume it's finite. So at time T1, that ball disappears. Okay? And the picture I will have is either this, namely RT1, RT1. Either the balls are not seeing each other or in principle they can be like that. Or they have met. This is the time where I'm going to choose the x1, x2. So I'm choosing after the fact um, the x1 to be, um, uh, where is it? Does anybody follow this calculation? Okay. How do I know in advance the T1? Because I put the X1, X2. I mean, it's clear what is the equations that I have. Huh? The RT dot is minus, I'm on the plane, 1 over I plus alpha T. The R dot little r is minus over alpha. Okay, that's rho r. And this is r plus alpha T. And the alpha T in our case is 3 times 2 RT plus RT inverse. This is the ODE. This is the, the argument I put here, okay? So I have this system of ODEs, and then the claim is that at some point uh, R goes to zero. Assume that's finite. Then from there on, I have this picture. I'm assuming that at that time, which I can find from the beginning, because this has nothing to do where the balls are, are, are fixed, I choose now, go back and choose from the beginning the distance between the x1 and x2, so that at that time t1, they will touch. And now at this point we have two options. Either the balls feel that are, they, they are really not together, it's like, the figure eight picture, it's like the picture I had before with the two touching balls. Either they think they are together or they don't. Okay, so uh, either gamma t moves as one set, and then one can find uh, that um, in this case, as t goes to infinity, it converges If it moves like one set, what changes? It changes because now the length is going to three will become one. That three is one, but now you have the length of the two, uh, the total length, which will be still two times that, but now this will drop down to one. Okay, is that clear? If what starts moving as in one set, then the velocity will, uh, the, the alpha t in this case will be two rt inverse. And if you move like that, you can check that as t goes to infinity, you are going to go to, uh, the set will converge to the ball with this radius. Or, gamma t1 is, uh, there are two different uh, balls, or whatever, two different sets. And, uh, and it remains, in which case it remains stationary. Because at that point, the alpha t will be exactly, if I didn't mess up, uh, yes. There, there are always two parts. So at time t1, this 3 becomes 2. And if it feels that there are two different components, each one has length 2 pi rt. The 2 pi is gone. So that 2 that comes from there drops with that 2. And the alpha t becomes exactly 1 over rt. 
But then what, that's what you need to get that to be zero. So I wrote down two different sets in this situation. The conclusion, therefore, is that there is interior, because if I could write down a level set formulation, and I'm not saying I can do it, I don't know how to write a level set formulation uh, for this problem because of the, um, uh, of the constraint, because the constraint depends on the solution, and therefore I don't know how to write a geometric PDE. Because if I were to write a geometric PDE, that velocity will depend on the solution itself, let's call it alpha of u, and I don't know how to do it. But what is clear is that if I could do it, or whatever you do, you have two possible sets here, and there is no way to choose a priori which one of the two uh, will happen. So that will be an example, again, of interior, whatever that means, because I don't have any definition here for interior. OK. So this is an explicit calculation. Um, this also is an explicit calculation, but at this point, do I have a PDE criterion to tell me uh, whether there is uh, interior or not? And indeed, I will write you down something as a theorem, and I will show you the proof of that because it's simple and it also explains to you what you can do with these cost solutions and, the, and the, all the symmetries we have on the problem, especially the fact that the solution is invariant under change of, uh, uh, that an increasing function is a solution. So I'm going to write here a theorem which if you think a little bit about it, says that something you cannot check is equivalent to something else that most probably you cannot check, uh, except in, in specific examples when you can check it. Uh, so I would say uh, no interior. Is uh, equivalent to say that our initial value problem, so let me recall, I have this problem. Star and the standing assumption says F degenerate elliptic and F geometric. So no interior is equivalent to saying that the star with u0 equals the characteristic function of omega0 minus the characteristic function of omega0 complement. Together with this equation, we should always think that we have a tripled So this is a thing about the sets. The equation is an auxiliary thing. So the theorem says um, if I have unique, no interior, if and only if, this equation with an initial data uh, 1 minus 1 uh, has a unique solution. OK. First of all, the fact that we reduce to initial data plus minus one makes sense because, as we said earlier, it doesn't matter how this thing becomes positive or negative. So in some sense, if I were to take things that look more and more like that, eventually I will get something that is one minus one. And it has an additional advantage because what the, what the fact, what, what you get out of the fact that it only depends on the boundary uh, and, and nothing in the, the specific form of the solution in the interior and outside, it tells you that really what matters is what geometrically you expect to happen, is what happens on the, on the, on the actual zero level set and nothing else. And this thing, as a, as a um, condition, it tells you, look, the only thing that matters is the location of that. Between can be one minus one. For all we care, it can be plus infinity, minus infinity. It's irrelevant. Whatever it is, is you have a solution that comes in like that, and then here there is a boundary. I'm writing it schematically at time t, and the only thing that matters here in order to have an equation is the curvatures of that boundary. Right? So the definition, the, the fact that only this thing matters is, uh, is I think, uh, clear if you see it like that. And, um, 
All right, so this is not a priori crazy. Now, of course, the, you're going to ask me, okay, I start with something discontinuous. The theorem uh, I said, I gave you before about the comparison require the initial data to be uniformly continuous. This is clearly not a uniformly continuous function, but the viscosity theory extends to being able to the setting where you have discontinuous data. Uh, I, 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 then you have to use a notion of subsolution. It extends to discontinuous solutions. Uh, then for, um, for subsolutions, which we don't know what it means, we use the upper semi-continuous envelope. And for super solutions, we use the lower semi-continuous em envelope. So there is a way to describe that. Now, I, what I want to do is I want to show you uh, what is the relation, without going through the details, what is the relationship between these two conditions. For example, how do you go from no interior to that? And that I want to do it because it's um, a little bit, uh, I always find it like magic, but it's very soft. And uh, I mean, the first time you see it, you think it's something really big, but let me show you the proof of that in particular because I want to use it for the next result. Okay. So how do you go from something that is continuous to something that is discontinuous and actually one minus one? Uh, you need to introduce a change of variables that somehow when you are positive, it goes to one, and when you're negative, you go to minus one. And that change of variables is very simple. So I'm starting with the assumption that uh, no interior. Uh, so I have... Um, uh, or if you like, I start with the assumption that I have a u0 that is nice, and therefore I have a u of xt. So when I say nice, I mean continuous, and I have a u of xt. That's the only thing I can define in my, my problem. And the interior or not has to do with the zero level set of that. Okay? Is it clear what I mean by that? I start with some initial data. This is what gives me the gamma t. I don't know any other way to define the gamma t. And now I want to claim that interior or no interior is equivalent to this statement. And then I introduce this function, hyperbolic tangent of u over epsilon. Now clearly when u is positive and you let epsilon go to zero, that goes to one. Uh, when u is negative and epsilon goes to zero, goes to minus one. And you have some difficulty what happens when uh, at, you are at zero. So I want to resolve that in one direction or the other. So I put an extra alpha here. Just to separate what happens at, uh, at, uh, uh, at zero. And it's not difficult to see now that as epsilon goes to zero, this goes to some so this is u alpha epsilon goes to some alpha infinity, which is 1 if u is bigger than alpha, is minus 1 if u is less than alpha, and it is 0 in the interior of the set that u is equal to alpha. That's calculus. Now, there is a property of the viscous solutions that allow you to say that since this is a solution, this is a solution. Why is it a solution? Because it's an increasing function of a solution. Since this is a solution, this is a solution. So theory, the PD theory, implies that uh, if this is a solution and this limit is local uniform, this function is a solution. And this is exactly the function we wanted to be 1, minus 1, and 0. Now, I didn't say exactly all the things that are happening here. So what is the thing we don't know about u infinity? Now, I'm going to, uh, so are these all the points? No, because uh, I may have interior. Uh, I, I don't say what happens on the boundary of this set A. And, uh, and so the rest of the points u alpha infinity at the rest of the points depend is, uh, it has to do with, uh, it's defined in terms of lower and upper semi-continuous envelope. And you take the limit. If the limit doesn't exist, you put either the limb sup or the limb inf. Okay? 
And now, let's say I define two functions. I define uh, one function to be u alpha to be, first I take alpha negative, and then I take alpha positive, The goal of that is that if I take alpha negative, I'm looking at a set where u is strictly positive. Well, I mean, I'm sorry, yes. If I take alpha negative minus alpha, yes. I'm looking at the set that u is strictly, has a strict sign one way or the other. So at the limit, I'm going over, what I have left over is the, the thing I don't know. Now, why is that true? Same, same result, this is an increasing limit of solution, so it's a solution. This is a decreasing limit of solution, it's a solution. And yes, it's discontinuous or whatever, but let's bear with that. Uh, this is, comes from, uh, from zero minus, and this alpha, uh, alpha goes to zero from zero plus. U alpha infinity was this, and I just call these things, uh, uh, I call that, uh, let me not call it like that. Let me call it uh, u alpha inf u bar infinity and um, u bar lo lower infinity, one in the other. Okay. And what are the values of this? The u bar infinity x t is equal to one if u is greater or equal to zero, and minus one if u is negative and u lower bar of xt is one if u is positive and minus one, I'm sorry, um, u is negative and minus one if u is less equal zero. So all this process, the alpha was there, it looks crazy, but uh, I, I have it there in order to get rid of it at the end, but find a way to really distinguish between the sets of strict sign. And now I look at that, and uh, the answer is there. If there is interior, that means this, and what happens, uh, yes, if there is interior, uh, these two things are different. Okay, because uh, if there is interior, uh, these two functions will be different, will depend on what happens there, uh, what happens there. One will see this, if there is interior, the u upper infinity sees that, If u is greater than zero and minus one if u is less than zero, is one if u is, uh, yeah, I'm negative and minus one. And, and what am I saying? And uh, I'm sorry. Okay, but did I write the same thing now? No, okay. So one function is this, while the other, is going to be there, and they will differ in the interior. One will be one in the interior, the other will be minus one. So I have two distinct solutions. Okay? And um, so, as I said, uh, that uh, proposition, uh, it's more important, or theorem is more important for later on, but it gives you um, a hope that perhaps you could uh, find the answer by looking at something more uh, complicated, but now uh, we we looked at this. Uh, we have a discontinuous solution, one minus one. Okay. Now I have to introduce. I'm about to introduce the second characterization of the solution, and I will connect them with this proof. So I'm more interested in the proof than the result, and it is indeed the case that if you don't know the uh, it's uh, that kind of a proof that uh, someone may say, well, you know, whoever, whatever the hell it does there, uh, this looks like magic, so whatever. Uh, so now I want to introduce, so I did level sets, so a little bit of history, the level sets, as I said, they were introduced by Osir and Sethian, and then there were two major results uh, um, in the theory, one was by 
uh, Evans, Evans and Struck that uh, Struck that looked at not Struck. What's the first name of Joel? Spruck. Okay, I said it correct. I said Struck. Spruck. So by Evans and Spruck. Uh, they had a series of papers from in curvature, and about the same time, Jen Gigagoto um, produced some uh, results for most um, uh, general equations that include all that, and then they open uh, the, the, for more things that have happened there. Uh, in the, maybe a few years later, uh, and, and these references now, they become um, uh, complicated because uh, there was this bracket solution. Uh, uh, met, uh, um, Evans had inherited a student who had started working with um, Diperna after Diperna passed away. That was Tom Ilmanen, uh, and gave him a problem like that. Ilmanen uh, got into geometric measure theory, so there was an issue about um, uh, whether you could do things with a bracket flow or not. And the reason there was this interest in, on that is that. Um, um, bracket flow, uh, which is based on minimization, doesn't see a comparison principle. So in theory, in principle, it works for systems, the same way of defining things. While this thing doesn't work for systems because it's based on maximum principle, so it's scalar. So there was for a while um, uh, a competition between these two approaches. So the distance function, let me put here Ilman and two because it's not clear exactly what, but I think it's mainly Sonner um, did that. Now, I may forget it, but when you come really to phase field theory, uh, there is an example where you cannot do it with bracket. And the reason is the bracket flow works for, uh, requires a famous monotonicity formula, because something has to give you some compactness on the measure. And there's a theorem, I believe, by Almgren, uh, not Almgren, uh, the guy at Duke, uh, help me out with names, uh, the other geometric uh, measure theory guy that was at, uh, at Duke. Yeah, I think there was a theorem that uh, said that if you have anisotropies, it's almost like a theorem in quotes, that if you have anisotropies, then you don't have a, a monodonistic formula. And therefore, for problems with anisotropy, the bracket approach will not work. And the, and, but on the other hand, even for scalar problems, on the other hand, what I'm describing in problems with anisotropy is going to work. So, you know, this is so that uh, for a while people cared about all that. So, and this is what I call here the distance function approach. After all, we derive this equation using the distance function. And routinely, when I look at the initial value data, uh, prob uh, the initial data, I assume I have a distance function. So can we go back to the original idea that said that uh, if, uh, uh, if you have a nice set and uh, you take the normal vector, which after all is the gradient of the distance function, can you write everything in terms of the distance function and nothing else? Then uh, you go and uh, you review, I don't know whether anybody did last week, but uh, if you look at mean curvature flow and you assume the flow is smooth, namely the surface is smooth, you find out that on the, on, when the distance is zero, it solves the heat equation. Okay, that's the connection between, uh, uh, in some sense, the, the, heat the, 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 the heat equation is the equation satisfied by the distance function of a surface moving by mean curvature on the surface. So that indicates that perhaps you can use the distance function when things are smooth. And then you look a little bit deeper into that and you find out that off, even when you have a smooth motion by mean curvature, off the set, off the zero set, the distance function does not solve anymore the, um, the heat equation, but it is a super solution when it's positive and it is a sub-solution to the heat equation if it's negative. And the reason is that if you go and you do the calculation and if you haven't seen it, go to Trudinger's book and it's there, uh, you get a term that looks like um, uh, distance times curvature or something like that. You get an extra term. And depending on the sign, you are, remember I'm dealing with sine distance function. So this has a sign, depending on what you have here, something is less equal to zero, something is. So even the, in the smooth case, 
the distance function does not solve exactly the, um, the heat equation. It's a super and sub solution. Okay, once you realize that, uh, you, you think about uh, saying, okay, let me, uh, let's try to do that uh, in, um, in general. And so here is now the result. This is what uh, the distance function definition, which of course, all these definitions I'm going to present you are equivalent if there is no interior, all right? Uh, so the theorem, oh no, I don't want to say that. Okay, I'm going to not present it. So what I'm saying here is something that I did with Baal, Sonner, and, uh, and myself, is not to start with the definition, but to show you from what we have done so far that the distance function satisfies an equation. So I have a flow, gamma t. Remember, gamma t means I have all this stupid thing. Uh, it's no interior. And uh, the claim then I will define as d lower bar, the distance, the minimum, the, uh, the negative part of the distance, the upper bar, the um, positive part of the distance. So uh, the picture, let me do it here. Uh, we have something like that. We don't have interior. This is positive. This is negative. And then the claim is, and this implies that there are two equations you can write. The distance, the lower, the negative part of the distance. So remember, I'm not separating this an equation or the whole domain is um, a subsolution. T is less or equal to zero. And what goes here? Now here goes a term that looks a little bit strange, but it has a very nice geometric interpretation. Sonner did it uh, without x dependence, so this was, took some time to see it. So you cannot evaluate it at x. You have to translate it like that, and the, and the positive part of the distance function solves Okay, why do you have that? Remember now, I'm looking, I'm evaluating, uh, at, I have in mind that everything is evaluated on, on, the, on gamma t. Okay, so everything should be evaluated at gamma t. That's the whole idea of the distance function. You only care what happens when the distance is, is uh, zero. And what these terms tell you, tell you here is the following. If you are off the, if you are off the, um, the gamma t, you have to move back or forward, depending on the sign, in the normal direction, this distance to go back on the gamma t. So anytime you evaluate your equation, you are in a location here, the, the interpretation of that is you need to go back this distance to be on the, there. Now, of course, all these things are in the viscosity sense, so nothing has derivatives here. Okay, the distance function is almost everywhere differentiable and actually has a second derivative almost everywhere, but this is defined in a different way. So when this is an interpretation of that, it's not an actual proof, okay? And there is a second part. You have the following. And again, I will write it and then I'll try to explain it. Uh, this is where the distance is negative. So. I know there are big things, but I will write now immediately what it means in, the, in case of the...
Okay, what are these things? What, is the, what are all these things? So let's go to the example of, the, of the, uh, what we had from the beginning. So let's look at what all these things mean in the case where the problem we have is uh, uh, the trace of identity minus du, du over du square, d square u plus a of x du. Let's look this definition at that, not definition, consequence. No interior, we are fine. So what that says is that, uh, let's say, uh, in Rd, zero infinity, the negative distance function will solve I'll do it only in that thing, so we don't write something. So this will be a of x minus d and in the set where the distance function is negative, you have, what is that term there? That term is exactly this. Okay? This term for the distance function, this crazy looking term here, is exactly that quantity. So this has a sign. In the positive set, in the negative set. This is an equation everywhere. Uh, basically, but I cannot really say it in the viscous sense everywhere. It's an almost everywhere statement. So I have this less equal zero, and then I go back to the equation. What do I get? I can drop that and get And this is the statement I told you from the beginning. That's the classical statement. This is what is true. Forget about this term if it confuses because of them. If we were at the case of the mean curvature flow, what do I find? That at the negative part, whenever the, if I'm outside the set, the distance function is a subsolution of the, of the heat equation. And that's sharp. So in this case, you do recover the classical result exactly like that. So. Um, uh, what Sonner did at the beginning was he introduced for mean curvature flow um, this thing as a definition that uh, the negative distance uh, is a subsolution and the positive distance is a super solution to the heat equation. That was uh, Sonner's definition. But then uh, one comes from the other. Of course, they are equivalent. Okay, and for that one needs one more theorem, but I, I don't want to kill you with all these things. Uh, let me show you a little bit, because it's on the blackboard. How do I get this equation? Where this thing comes from? All right, I write it down, but then, uh, and the proof is basically on the blackboard. So let's do it here. Let's continue this generalized uh, nonsense proof here. And uh, say what? Say that uh, okay. if you bought this argument, now remember, there is no interior, so there is only one solution like that. If you bought that argument, now this thing here, if you bought that this thing is a solution, then this function is a solution also. I don't know, let's put two bars.
hopefully this is the one I need. Right? I mean, I, you go from, from this to this by an increasing change of variables. And then if this is a solution, there is a, um, a fundamental property that you, a fundamental result from the theory of viscosity solution. I reserve the right that I have chosen. The, maybe I should have written down U law. Uh, but, so there is, a, there is a, um, something from the theory of viscosity solutions, which is called soup and inf convolution. So the, it's the equations I'm writing, you cannot regularize them by integrating by parts. That's the whole problem. So there is nevertheless a way to regularize, uh, mildly re re regularize things by using a soup or inf operation. And the, the result is, now I'm running out of bars. Okay, let's put a triple bar here and let's hope I did the correct one. Uh, so if I take soup over y of u bar infinity at yt minus x minus y, so I understand this is, this is crazy, but uh, this is a solu sub -sol solution. So I, I do the soup of that with x minus y. The claim is that this is a subsolution. That's a theory of, uh, that's something from the theory which you don't know, but this is the case. This is a subsolution of the equation where if there is x dependence on the problem at the places where the soup is achieved. But now let's see what happens here. What is that? I claim, if it's not correct, change it to inf with a plus, that this thing is exactly that. OK? Because it's the soup. And so when this is, uh, uh, you only see the boundary of the set, I mean, this is it, right? That's the answer. And since this is a subsolution, that proves the first part. Why do you have this translation? Uh, lots of worry about that right now. It's there. But, uh, so that's a subsolution. So that's automatically the proof of the first property. I told you it looks like magic. So that's that. Now, in reality, how do I do it? I put a k here instead of infinities, and then I let k go to infinity. Right? And what about the second property? The second property is that if you're now indeed on the place where the distance is negative, then at points of differentiability of the distance, because now it's the actual distance, you will have, you don't quite have that. What you have is that the gradient of this quantity will, be, will have the right sign. So this is technical. So you have this, which in some sense implies that what I claim there. OK, uh, this requires now, uh, we have to get more involved for this. Yes? Uh, no, once I'm here, I don't care about the geometric thing anymore. Uh, no, no, I need the geometric because I need the invariance under the uh, change of increasing change of variables. Yeah. All right, so that's the proof of this statement. It turns out, but I'm not going to write it down, that the converse is true. If I start, if I start so uh, if I start with uh, triple, gamma t, omega t, gamma t, omega, whatever, and I take the sign distance from that triple. If the sign distance satisfies that, then if I solve the, the, the original equation with the initial data, the sign distance, I'm going to get something that has the same interfaces. Which brings me, so let me write this thing as a fact, and then we can move to phase field. So let's specify, let's just concentrate on mean curvature. 
remember the stupid notation in curvature of u. Uh, u at time t equals 0, let's say the sine distance By the way, do, do you see why I have to use a sine distance? Because when I'm smooth, if I use the correct distance, I have a singularity here at the zero. While if I take the sine distance, I remove the singularity of the distance. Okay. Um, therefore, that's equivalent to saying that the negative part of the distance satisfies this in wherever the distance is negative. And satisfies that okay it's equivalent to this that's the definition we're going to give uh, I need to put the extra one down there Actually, I'm not going to put it. This is it. It turns out that, 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 that these two things for mean curvature are equivalent. OK. So now we go to phase field theory. And the canonical result here is the following. I start with this equation. Let me write it, then I'll explain how we get to that. OK. Now here we have a, I have a problem. F is equal capital uh, OK. I don't know, W prime, where W is a potential that has two wells. Sorry for the stupid notation, but I used F before. So let's specialize these things to be 1 minus 1. And this is W. And with this picture, this F is either plus or minus here. All right, so let me put, it's one or the other, not both. So let me put it here, plus or minus with a question mark, 1 over epsilon square, W prime U epsilon. Again, it has to do with whether you put it on the right-hand side or not, and by now, I have no clue <laughs> where it goes. Now, this problem is a famous problem. Um, it comes, this equation comes up with the name Allen Kahn. And that, uh, this Allen and Kahn were two metallurgists that um, uh, wrote a model for uh, alloys with two materials. And then uh, up to some uh, kind of um, uh, long, uh, and they wanted to understand how, uh, how uh, the interface evolves in time. And after a lot of formal analysis and scaling, they decided, uh, they, they made the conjecture that the interface moves by mean curvature. So that's the applied side. Even before them, there was a work of uh, uh, another paper by physicists Kawasaki, Ota, and Jasno, where they were perturbed here by space-time white noise, and we're trying to see what happens. That's the connection with the thing I mentioned in the previous lecture. OK, um, why, uh, OK, so, but why did this become also famous in Italy? Not because of the Allen Kahn, but for the fact that the evolution equation can be seen as a gradient flow So if you define this energy functional, then this sort of PDE is the gradient flow of this. And there was a an, 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 um, an, an, an result by, I guess, the mass and Modica, was it? Uh, Mortola, yes. Which they were saying that is as if you look at that problem and you look at the minimization of this, 
of epsilon, then the minimum converges to a minimal surface, which was where the, the limit is plus or minus one. So that was related to minimal surface. Okay, and because of that, uh, then one start, uh, the George, I think, got into, I don't know, I mean, most probably he gave them the problem, but um, uh, then there was also from the Ital Italian side, not from the point of view of the Alan Kahn equation, but from the Italian side, very much interest to see that since at epsilon, at the time equals zero, this was giving you minimal surface, whether if you let uh, epsilon, go to, if you look at the evolution problem, you let epsilon go to zero, whether that will give you motion by mean curvature, okay? Uh, the why, how the heck the motion by mean curvature, the minimal surface comes here, it's, uh, it's based on this um, amazing, I mean, they did more than that, but because this is just a formal argument. This from below is bounded by du square, I mean du, which can be seen as the gradient of some and the minimizers will, uh, will go to minimizers, and that's the thing you, you, you um, minimize when you find minimal, uh, minimal surfaces. Okay. Uh, now let's see whether one can uh, make sense of the epsilon problem. So you start with this problem and you put an initial data, let's say, okay, and this was one minus one, to simplify things, let's take my initial data to be between minus one and one. And what we are interested in is what happens as epsilon goes to zero. Are you going to say, did Allen and Kahn write epsilons? No, Allen and Kahn wrote this. And that was the equation they used to, to characterize the, uh, the, um, the interface of the alloys and they look at that for large T. But one way to look for large T is to scale the problem. So if, I, if this is U and you write U epsilon of X T as U of X over epsilon over T over epsilon square, Notice I didn't put T over epsilon here because in this case for the assumptions it's irrelevant. If you do this scaling, which is a parabolic scaling, then this U epsilon solves that problem. So understanding what the limits of that is understanding the limits of this problem for T going to infinity for X staying in a compact set. And here, here's the theorem. So what happens if you let epsilon go to zero? If you let epsilon go to zero, uh, you're going to take this, you're going to put it there. And you get at the limit, if you could pass to the limit, you can get enough bounds that uh, almost everywhere the u epsilon goes to places where w prime is zero, so you go to minus one, one. So if you just look at the problem, what you find is that as epsilon goes to zero, the u epsilon will go to plus minus one, but you don't know where this plus minus one is. So the theorem is the following. u epsilon goes to zero, and uh, let me make it, uh, let, me, let me call gamma zero the place where u epsilon zero is zero. u as epsilon goes to zero, it goes to one and minus one, as you would expect it. But now it goes to one if it is inside and goes to minus one if you are outside uh, the flow uh, gamma t which moves by mean curvature. Okay? And that's for all times and so on. And, um, and to do that all times, there were before results by the Modoni and Sassman uh, for, as a result, up to the first time the interface was, uh, after, up to the first time singularities Develop, but uh, with uh, Sonner and Evans, we got this proof uh, global in time. And I would say perhaps this is the first proof that uh, got the Quran crowd to believe that there was something about viscose solutions. Up to that point, they considered it to be a Kruskov in L infinity, which is uh, correct. All right, so this is the result what I'm pushing for. 
and um, I, don't, I cannot do it in a, in a minute. So that's the result. So what I'm going to do tomorrow is first of all derive for you formally how the mean curvature comes up from here. It's a beautiful calculation in a paper by uh, Keller, Rubinstein, and Sternberg. I think it's written like Rubinstein, Keller, Sternberg, or some permutation, which I highly advise to all students to read it because that's a place where they're doing just formal computations, but they are correct in their formal computations and also gives you an idea about what it is that you should do if you don't know the result and you try to expand in epsilon. It's a, very, it's a beautiful short paper. And um, so I will present you that and we'll make clear why, where the mean curvature flow comes from in, a, in terms of an asymptotic expansion. Then I will show you a very simple proof of that based on the distance function. And then I will explain to you why this doesn't, doesn't work if the problem is anisotropic. I will give you an an, a problem where, it's anisotropic, where you have anisotropy, and then I will tell you what is that you have to change to make it from that. And that maybe we'll finish tomorrow's lecture. And then I have three more lectures to talk a little bit about um, uh, particles, uh, maybe homogenization, and, mean, and moving fronts, and uh, I don't know what else we'll, we'll see. Okay, so let me stop here.